Okay. So what we're going to do is uh, I'm going to give you a pearl stringing demonstration, and then while I'm tying some of the knots, we can talk about uh, different things about pearls. You know, I'll give you a different kind of an, an overview, a real no-nonsense demystified overview. And what you need when you string pearls, you need some pearls, you need some thread, you probably need some clippers and maybe some tools if something gets stuck. Um, this is called French wire, which is probably not French and probably not wire, but I'll explain this to you. Um, you'll need a needle. This is for closing up the end of the pearls. It's a very, very high-tech, uh, let's see, this is uh, L'Oreal made this one. It's clear nail polish. Easy to find anywhere. I got this at Walmart. Tweezers are helpful. In my case, glasses, hearing aid batteries. I don't know if all of you need those things. And we're ready to get started. So first thing is the thread. And people ask me uh, what kind of thread to use. Of course, you're going to want to know that. And let me just tell you, there is no perfect solution to what to put pearls on. I use silk thread most of the time. It's the classic thing to use. The pearls sit really beautifully on your neck when you, you, know, when you put the knots in, but it's going to break sometimes. You can use a high-tech thread, like a synthetic thread, which won't break as easily, but it's going to stretch and the pearls aren't going to look very good. Uh, if I'm putting gemstones with the pearls, I might use a high-tech wire called soft flex, but you can't put knots in the soft flex. There is one called knottable that I use, but really it's only for finishing the ends. You don't put the knots in between every pearl. And so it, it's good if you've got a gemstone with sharp edges that's going to cut the thread, but it's not so great if you want something that, that looks really elegant. Next thing we have are the needles. The needles that I use are called flex needles. Uh, when you take this class, you don't have to worry about it. I have everything written down, what you're going to need, sizes. Every, I have all this information for you. So this time, just watch, and then you can take the class. This needle, normally I do this in a smaller room, but we're recording it so that I can make a DVD later on. Um, so normally I would pass this around, but you can come to the shop and see it. And what it is, it's a tiny, tiny piece of twisted wire with a very big eye so that it's pretty easy to get the thread in. And you see, it's really soft. I can poke myself with it. It bends. So this, the large eye of the needle collapses down when you put it through the first pearl. So it's really, it's easy to thread, it's easy to use, and it's easy to get through the pearls. When you take the class, um, when you're putting this needle through the pearls, if you find a little bit of resistance, don't shove the needle into the pearl. It's not going to make it go faster. You just feel around until you feel the place where it's easy to go through. And it's usually pretty easy to go through. Now, in the classic technique of stringing pearls, what you do is you use a tweezer like this. And you put one pearl on, and then you tie a knot, and you make sure with this tweezer that the knot is right down at the first pearl. And then you put the second pearl on and go through it that way. Um, so I started, I started stringing pearls, and I just didn't like this technique because it was very hard to do. If I made a long pearl lariat, I made one that was, I think it was 48 inches one time, and there was one little space where the knot wasn't close enough. It was maybe a sixteenth of an inch loose. And I, you know, I didn't want to restring it, but it just didn't look good. So what I had to do was take every single pearl out, cut the threads between each one, pull the little knots out, and start over again. Um, because the pearls have to be strung on one continuous thread. You can't string them 
you can't just fix this. A lot of people will come to me and they'll say, oh, my clasp came off. Why do you have to restring, redo the whole thing? Can't you just put the clasp back on? And the answer is, doesn't work that way. So, um, so I didn't really like this technique. And the main reason is when I was hunching over the beadboard, because I would really you know, work all day, and then in the beginning I was sitting up all night making jewelry, and it would make my neck and my back ache. So eventually from stringing hundreds of strands, I devised this technique that I'm going to show you. And it's really, really easy. It's easy to teach. It's easy to learn. And in your very first strand of pearls, you're going to be able to make your own jewel. And a lot of people say, well, I already have pearls, and why do I need to do that? Um, so let me ask you a couple questions while I'm doing this. Uh, who here has pearls? <laughs> who here? Who here has had them? OK, how often do people have them restrung? How often? How often do you restring your pearls? Never? How many people have restrung their pearls never? Oh my god. How many people How many people restring them every year or two? Okay. Pearls absolutely need to be restrung every year or two depending on how often you wear them. Um when I was years before I was in the jewelry business, I borrowed my mother's pearls. And I was in a taxi cab, and they broke. I don't know how they broke. They didn't seem to catch on anything. They broke. And I thought I had picked up all the different segments, but when I had them restrung and brought them back to my mother, she couldn't even fit them around her neck. I didn't really know why that had happened until a couple of months ago. I was looking at a strand of pearls in my collection, and I'd had it for a little while, and it just, it, it just looked a little bit tired, so I decided to restring it. No one had ever worn this strand of pearls. And as I was restringing it, it was falling apart in my hands. I didn't realize that the thread actually loses its integrity. It kind of disintegrates over the years. So for one thing, you want to restring your pearls because you don't want them to fall apart and you're going to lose something. It isn't. I know now it's not just a question of losing one little segment at the end. You can lose you know, you can lose a whole, a whole group of them. Um, the other thing is a lot of people say to me, well, why do I need to restring my pearls? Um, they say, I only wear them once or twice a year. Well, think about this. If you had a white silk shirt and you only wore it once or twice a year, but you would still get skin cells and perspiration and, you know, and then that perspiration would sit on the thread, and then you'd pull it out the next year, and you'd wear it again. And if you did this over years, imagine what the collars and cuffs of your white silk shirt are going to look like. So that's another reason that you want to restring them. It's just, even just restringing them is going to make them look really fresh and new and pretty. You would be amazed at how different they're going to look. Oh, I forgot. There's one more thing you need if you're going to string a strand of pearls. You need a clasp. Now, this is the French wire. And obviously, you can't see this, but the French wire comes in a little bag. And again, when you come into the shop, I'll show you. It's, it's really like a tiny little slinky. And what this is going to do is going to protect the thread in the place that it's most vulnerable, which is where it sits against the clasp. So here we have. Now, this is the key to my technique. What we're going to do is put, I'm just going to do a little segment so I can show you the start and the finish. We're going to put the whole necklace on the strand. It also gives us the advantage of being able to measure it, have a look at our design. If we have a pattern, then we can look at the pattern, see how it fits, see if we want to. It's much easier if you decide that one little rondelle is going to make the necklace look better. It's easier to do that. Uh, when it's only on the thread without the knots, then after you've done the knots, you've really got to start over. So what I'm going to do is put all of the pearls on the thread. I've got the, the clasp here, the French wire, wire, and I'm bringing the first pearl right to the middle. I reach down for the needle, and now I'm going to run the needle through the very first pearl.
You never want to go really fast because going fast doesn't save you time. It just tangles up your thread, although you can go faster when you get practice at it. Now what's happened is the French wire has wrapped itself around the clasp so that rather having just thread leaning against the clasp where the metal is going to rub it and it's likely to break, you've got metal protecting the thread. Now, because we've got this whole thing on, you've got two pieces of thread, and instead of using a tweezer to bring the knot down to the pearl, all we do is tie this just like you're tying a shoelace, and you tie a knot, and that's how easy it is. I should probably not tell everybody this. I should pretend that it's really hard, so you think I'm smart for being able to string pearls, but I think it's more fun to teach you how to do it. And then here I am on film doing a demonstration and I embarrass myself and get the needle caught. So now that we've got this on, all we're gonna do is go piece by piece and string the pearls. Now another reason to learn, um, maybe that single strand of pearls that you have, maybe you're not wearing it so much. Maybe it's a little bit of an old fashioned look and you think it would be more interesting if you had a pendant. Or maybe you just brought bought a red dress and you just want something to go with your new red dress and you pick up a ruby briolette or something. Once you know how to do this, you don't have to have your single strand of pearls be a single strand of pearls. You can keep reworking them every time you buy some new beads or you might even start looking at things differently. I had a dress, I bought this dress I really liked but it had wooden beads on the shoulders and I didn't, really, I didn't really like the beads on the shoulders. I didn't like the way they looked and they were uncomfortable. So I took them off and put a cord instead. And I had the beads sitting in a drawer. And then I looked at them one day and I realized they would look really pretty with pearls. So I mixed the pearls and the wood beads. So you start, <clears throat> while you're doing this, you know, once you learn it, once you've got the technique down, it's, it's just so much fun and it's so easy to keep reworking things you have and every time you find new beads, you can do something different. I brought a few strands of beads if anybody here wants to learn and they really don't want to buy another strand of pearls. I've got some amber beads, coral beads. I've got pearls in shapes you wouldn't necessarily recognize. I have hollow pearls. I have all sorts of really interesting things. So it doesn't have to be another strand of round pearls. And you can see as I do this, I'm barely paying attention. I'm just stringing along. I'm talking. This is how easy it is. And yes, of course, um, I've done a lot of strands, so I'm used to it. But I promise you guys, I have taught, taught a woman with Parkinson's whose hands were shaking. I taught a woman who had glaucoma. And the day after she finished the cruise was going in for surgery. And I taught a woman whose local bead shop told her she was unteachable, which I thought was horrifying. But that's another. Um, does anybody have any questions? I'll pause for a minute. Any questions? So Sonia? What do you do with a double strand? Oh, a double strand of pearls? Same, same thing you do, um, it depends how you want them to sit. If you want them to nest inside of each other, then you put the first, you do the first strand. The next strand is going to be about, it depends how you want it to sit really. Do you want them to nest inside of each other and be right up against each other or do you want a space? So once you do the, the inside strand, then you can experiment with the other. Usually it would be about four pearls different, but it depends on your neck. And this is also the advantage of doing this yourself. Um, you know, if somebody else did it for you and you weren't there, they would have to guess. But while you're at home doing it, you can measure, make sure you've got it exactly right. Uh, if anybody wants to make multi-strand necklaces, I have multi-strand clasps also. That's another thing, sometimes just finishing you know, just putting a fresh clasp, something more modern and updated, is also going to change the whole look of your pearls. Okay, so I did, I kind of fibbed to you just for convenience, um, but let me straighten out the fib now. I told you that we're going to put the whole necklace on. What, what I actually do is I put the whole necklace except for a few pearls in the very end. Now 
I'm going to add the last two or three pearls. And remember that by two or three pearls, I'm an artist. It could be one, it could be five, it could be eight. It doesn't really matter. Depends on the length you want the necklace and how you measured it, and maybe you changed your mind. So you put the last several. Can't find the last one. Okay. So I've got the last, I've put an extra three pearls on. Now I'm going to get the other piece of French wire. Put that on the clasp. Oh, sorry. I just flipped that off into the air. You know, another really nice thing, um, I've had a lot of um, people make pearls as gifts for daughters, granddaughters, nieces, wives, friends. It's really really nice when you know how to make something and you can make a gift for somebody instead of buying something in a store. I think it, it winds up meaning a lot more to, to the recipient, especially, you know, a granddaughter or a daughter. Of course, I've had a lot of women that make something for their daughter and they get halfway through and their daughters see this. That's another story. Okay, so now I'm at the end. And this time, what I'm doing is I leave these three pearls leaning right up against the other pearls. Now I've got the French wire, I have the clasp, I pull them into place, and what I want to do is leave a little, not so much room that it shows, but not make them too tight, because now what I'm going to do is tie this knot again. I've gone through one pearl, I'm tying the knot in between, Going through the second pearl, again, tying another knot. Okay, this time, and I'll teach you how to do this knot really easily. You're just wrapping this around the pearls, pulling the knot tight. Now, when you go through this last pearl, Now this is the one place that you actually get to fix if you've made a little bit of a mistake and you have a gap. So we're going through the last pearl and now the very beginning of my thread is right next to the very end of my thread. So all I'm going to do here is tie a knot, make it a double knot, sometimes just to be extra careful. I'll flip it over and do this again. And then I get the clippers. I cut the tail of the thread off. And we have a necklace, well, small necklace. I'm going to pass this around and you guys can have a look at the French wire while we just have a little overview. Let's see, here, do you want to, <coughs> you got, <coughs> okay, question? Oh, right on the very end, on the knot at the very end, that's where you use the clear nail polish. It, it can unravel if you don't use something to secure it. Some people use crazy glue. I don't like crazy glue because I don't like the way it feels. I always get it on my fingers. Um, the nail polish is just easy. You dab it on, rub it into the knot, and off of the pearl, and you're done. Question? Yeah. Uh, I have a, a strand of crystals that broke while I was on the ship. Uh, can you string crystal beads the same way? Sure, sure. You can string anything with this technique. Um, we could look at the crystals and see what they were strung on. Sometimes, I don't work that often with um, crystals, but they have a, I know when you work with gemstone beads, they have a sharp edge that often cuts the thread. So if it's crystals, we'll just have a look at them and make a decision what's the best thing to put them on. They also have a much bigger hole than, than most gemstone beads. Um, we've got a little bit of time, so if, 
Does anybody want like a quick overview of pearls and the different types of pearls? Okay, when we go into the shop, I'm gonna teach you all this with really hands-on. But just a quick, a quick history um, in terms of the types of pearls. Uh, pearls, as everybody I'm sure knows, an irritant floats into a mollusk, and in order to protect its soft little body, it creates, it puts nacre on the, on the irritant. The nacre is the pearl material. Originally, um, pearls, there was a whole pearl diving industry uh, where people would have to go look for pearls. Mickey Moto, uh, around 1900, started pearl farming. A lot of people are a little bit confused I personally don't like the term natural pearls because I think it's confusing. I don't even know when people come and they ask me, is this natural or cultured? Sometimes I don't even understand exactly what question they're asking. So let me just put it this way. Um, there are no more pearl divers. The pearl, nobody in the whole time I've been in the business, it's only 11 years, I have never one single time had a pearl vendor or a pearl store or another designer show me any pearl and say, wow, this necklace was made of pearls that were found randomly in a mollusk because something floated in by accident. The only place you're probably going to find a pearl that occurs in that way is in a restaurant in your dinner when you're eating clams. Okay, so let's just forget that. Now, does anybody know anyone who's had in vitro fertilization? Anyone? Okay. Um, can I ask you, the child that was born, is it a synthetic child? Okay. <laughs> End of story. What the pearl farming is, it's in vitro for pearls. It doesn't make a synthetic pearl. It doesn't make a synthetic adult. It's just, it's a pearl. Um, so all pearls now are farmed. All the pearls you're going to find, they're farmed, unless they're plastic. And maybe, I don't know, comes from a plastic tree or something. But that's a different story. Um, if you have pearls from your grandmother, they were most likely from Japan. Uh, they're saltwater pearls. They could also be Tahitian or South Sea, and I'll get to that in a minute. But if you have small white pearls, they're probably from Japan. Then the Chinese started farming pearls. And at first they made those pearls that look like Rice Krispies. So then everybody thought, wow, this is a really fun new look, and pearls are so beautiful on the skin no matter what shape they are. So that everyone said, well, these are fun, but the Chinese can't make round pearls. And then the Chinese made round pearls. And then everybody laughed at them and they said, well, the Chinese make round pearls, but they can't make shiny pearls. Okay, so then they made round shiny pearls. And then even 11 years ago when I was in the business, everybody said, oh, but the Chinese don't know how to make big round pearls. And guess what? Now they make big round shiny pearls. They make every kind of pearls. The Chinese are amazing at making things. So. Now you've got the freshwater pearls and the saltwater pearls, the Akoya Japanese pearls. And the freshwater pearls, the, these numbers aren't exact, but let's just say the Japanese can put maybe 12 irritants in one mollusk and it would take, let's say, seven years to grow. The Chinese can put 50 in a mollusk and take three years to grow the same size pearl. So they're growing more, more pearls, they're growing them a lot faster, and they're also growing them with a very, very tiny irritant. The Chinese put a tiny shred of pearl material, whereas the Akoya pearls have um, a larger bead. So the Chinese pearls are extremely hardy. They're very robust, and if you're mixing them with gemstones and crystals and you're knocking them around and using them for bracelets, they're, they're not going to scratch as easily, and if they do, you're just going to get down to more nacre. Now, the Japanese are still making much more perfectly round pearls, and when you come into the shop, I'm going to show you the difference, and I'll show you, I have a strand of pearls for, I think it's like 550 peach pearls, and I have a strand of pearls for 3,500. When you first look at them, they're almost identical, but when I sit with you, I'll teach you how to tell the difference and what the differences are. I have um, some pearls for about 250 that look almost identical to a $9,000 strand of pearls that I have. But again, you're going to learn the difference. Um, to clean the pearls, I just wipe them with a cloth. You're, the oils of your skin are actually good for the pearls. Um, 
don't keep them in plastic bags, but it doesn't mean you can never touch them to plastic. I travel with mine in a plastic bag. I just don't, if you're keeping it in your safe for years, don't keep it in a plastic bag. Now, I just want to, I'm going to go back to the different types. What I want to teach you is how to recognize what gives pearls their cost, but I also want everybody to take away the idea of better, best, worst. The most expensive pearl you're going to find is a very large, perfectly round, deep golden color South Sea pearl. Now, if someone gave me a strand of those, I would be really happy because I would sell them and have some money, I hope. But I wouldn't wear them because I don't look good in yellow. Deep golden is just not my color. Um, my bone structure doesn't look good with very large, perfectly round pearls, and it's not my taste. I personally prefer a Baroque, an oddly shaped pearl. So I want you guys to get this concept of better and best out of your head. We're going to do art here. We're going to create, we're going to have vision, and we're going to figure out what works for your taste and your budget. I love great wine. I love Chateau Margaux but I am not in a Chateau Margaux everyday budget. So I go with a $7 bottle of Pinot Grigio. But I also love designer handbags. And I, even though nobody sees but me how beautiful they are on the inside and nobody necessarily knows what I'm carrying, I like them. So I'll find the money for a designer handbag instead of using a copy because those are my values. That's where my taste is. So likewise, if you can afford it, and you want to enjoy a strand of perfect pearls, perfect luster, perfect surface area, perfectly round, then you should go for it. But if you're in a Pinot Grigio budget and you want to look, and maybe you want to just make something to go with one outfit, then go with the less expensive ones. I have pearls starting at $48 a strand, and they're still pearls and they still look beautiful against the skin. And some people prefer them because they're more interesting. They have circles around them. I call them Saturn pearls. I have ovals. I have petal-shaped pearls. So we're going to forget the idea of better, best, worse. Um, let's see. We've got a couple more minutes. So really quickly, um, let's see. We also, so there's fresh water. There's a koya. The next most expensive pearls are going to be Tahitian pearls. They, um, they have a beautiful gray color, and the gray can be uh, golden, teal, rose, aqua. It can have all sorts of different tints and shades to it. Uh, I'm going to show you Tahitian pearls, and I'm going to show you dyed gray pearls. And again, this is the analogy between Coke and Dr. Pepper. I can describe to you all day long the difference in the taste. I can describe to you all day long the difference in the look of natural Tahitian pearls and dyed gray pearls, but you have to look at them. And once you look at them, you're going to see the difference. And I don't think you'll ever have to ask again if it's a natural color or if it's dyed. Um, Tahiti is the only place in the world that pearls naturally grow gray. I think, um, Sonia, do they also sometimes in, in Australia, in the South, in Australia, Australia also can, um, is producing some natural gray pearls. It's still the South Sea. And of course, the South Sea deep golden pearls come from, uh, come from mostly Australia. And they are, they're beautiful. I have, uh, I have some very pale yellow Baroque South Sea pearls at a really great price if you're interested. Um, I strung them up just for putting them in the display, but we can use them. We can cut them apart. And by the way, don't anybody worry about buying really good pearls and stringing them yourself you're not going to hurt them. I mean, I, I took this needle and I poked it right into my own face. You're not going to hurt the pearl by handling them and stringing them and restringing them. You're not going to do anything to it. So don't worry about that. If you have really good pearls at home, do it yourself. Um, another thing, and this isn't really pertinent to the class but, class, but everybody always says to me, I think my person who restrung my pearls stole one pearl from me. People don't make their living doing that. When we restring them, they're going to be a little bit shorter because the string isn't stretched out anymore. Do you have a question? It's a, oh, I thought you did. Does anyone have a question? That's a yawn. <laughs> Hi. Um, you clearly have a passion for pearls. <clears throat> I took my mother-in-law's pearls in to um, 
see if I could sell them to a jeweler, and they had no interest in the pearls. They said that the resale value is nothing. You know, pearls are so plentiful, um, and they don't, you know, they don't know, if someone buys pearls that are used, I get, especially a jeweler, they don't really know um, how you've been taking care of them, how long you've been wearing them, if the nacre's worn through. Um, if you take your grandmother's pearls and roll them in front of your eyes, you'll probably see the bead. Um, it's called winking. You can almost see the bead that, that's used as, to, as the nucleus of the pearl. It's the first time anybody asked me about resale value. Um, and I, maybe eBay? <laughs> and you know, a lot, of, a lot of jewelry shops, a lot of consignment shops, but it's, it's not, I don't think pearls are an investment. Sometimes people come to me um, and they ask me, like they'll come and they'll show me some pearls from their great grandmother and ask me if they have value and my answer is that I don't have anything from my great-grandmother, so I think it has value in that way of handing down to someone who cares about them. Any other questions? Yes? You were talking about um, the, the, the perfect round uh, pearl. Where would the Baroque pearl fit into that in terms of, of uh, value and, and what have you? Okay, good question. Um, pearls, the thing that gives pearls their cost is going to be the size, the roundness, um, the surface area, and the luster. Now, Baroque kind of goes into a whole other category. Uh, the Baroque shape, the best way I can describe it, it's usually rounded on one end and a little bit teardrop on the other end. And it's much more affordable than a perfectly round pearl. but for me personally, I'll take Baroque pearls over round pearls any day. I love them, unless I'm using the round pearls for a look. If I'm using the round pearls to use my, I don't know if any of you noticed, I have these uh, clips that go onto pearls that you can make a choker, you can make all different shapes with your necklaces. Those, I want a round pearl because I'm doing, I'm putting something on them and I want the pearls, you know, that reflect on the skin and make the face look beautiful, but not necessarily take over the design. I use round pearls when I'm mixing them sometimes with gemstones because, again, I want the look but not necessarily just a strand. So in terms of value, a Baroque pearl is less expensive than a, a round pearl, but in terms of value to me, I like them better. Any, any other questions? Oh, I'm sure as soon as I get off this stage, I'll think, oh my god, I forgot to tell them this or that or the other thing. But the next step, I guess, is for everybody to come to the shop. If you want to learn more about pearls, I will put them in your hands and really make sure you understand the difference of the cost and the value. And then if you want to take the class, um, there is no class fee, but I have pearls for sale. And the pearls start at about uh, $48 a strand, you know, plus the clasp, which I have some for, I think, 20 um, so for $68, you can really get started and make your own strand of pearls. I know what it costs me to have pearl strung as someone in the business, but I wanted to know what other people were paying for the service. So I went online and I Googled pearl stringing. I called a bunch of stores. A lot of stores wouldn't even touch anybody's pearls unless the person bought it from that store because it's a pain in the butt. Um, but uh, I went in a chat room where a lot of people were talking about the cost, and it seems the average is about $100 a strand. So if you say, okay, I already have pearls, I don't want to buy another strand, you can buy it for less than the cost of restringing once, and you have a gift to give somebody. And the first time, if you don't do it, if you want to do it and you don't do it, the first time you have your pearls restrung, you're going to feel silly, and the second time, you're going to feel really silly. So if it's something you want to do, I know that people have that mental hurdle of, I already have pearls, but I, I promise you, Knockwood, Kennehar, I haven't had one complaint yet. Everybody's been really happy that they did the class. And I wouldn't, and, and I, I'm not usually a pushy person. The only reason I push people is because I know how much everyone loves it in the end. So if you're at all interested, come do that. Pardon? Well, if you bring your own pearls, then I think it would be fair 
to to pay me some kind of a class fee for the for the teaching because it does take it does take a lot of time. So we could do that either way. I, you know, that's not a problem. But I still think it'd be better if you get the extra ones. And then the other thing is, if you buy the extra pearls, once you learn how to do it, you you need materials. You're still going to need pearls and beads and briolettes and things that you know as your hands get used to the technique then your imagination starts to take off. Another thing I've been doing is um, a lot of people come in and they don't want to just learn how to string a strand of pearls. They want to design something completely different. And I have chain, I've got cords, I've got um, different tools and split rings and all sorts of things. So what some people have been doing is just we sit down and they pick out their materials and design something and then I figure out how to make it or we figure it out together. So the extra strand of pearls that you buy, I think you're going to find you're using it over and over again and different things and loving it. I, I started doing this completely by accident 11 years ago. Uh, I really only wanted to borrow some gemstone beads to take to people in offices. I had just gotten, I'd left my career to go to a dot com and then it went bust and we got laid off and I just wanted to get through Valentine's Day while I figured out what was next. And I went home with all these gemstone beads and I just fell in love with them. And, you know, for a couple of necklaces, I paid someone to string and then I took a two-day class, which, by the way, cost me $650 at Gemological Institute. So you're getting a good deal here. And, and I was addicted. I, the first time I went to look at pearls, I was planning to buy maybe one or two strands and I walked away with 20 strands of pearls, nauseous, thinking, oh my God, how am I going to sell 20 strands of pearls? And now, thousands of strands later, it hasn't been a problem. So, okay, any more questions? Now we're getting where they're going to start giving me the look. We got six more minutes. Oh, good question. Um, what I've done for the next, for today and four days after, oh, the question is, is there a sign-up sheet? Um, every day at 10 and 3, I call that the meeting time, knowing that, thank you, knowing that at least you can find me there at 10 and 3. But really, the way I do it is, whenever you guys want to come, I'm going to be there from 10 until the last one of you decides to go to lunch. Um, so sometime between 12 and 2, I'll disappear for lunch. And in case we have people that wait till 1 or 2, then I'll go eat lunch, come back by 3. So I'm going to be available to you pretty much for the next four and a half days. The last two days, I got a pack that takes me a long time packing the jewelry up. So. I won't have time to do any more classes. So we've got four and a half days to make whatever you want. But don't wait till the end, because you're going to really enjoy it. Probably want to make extra things. Any more questions? No. Nope. Wait, yes? Do you, have the needles and, do you have the needles and supplies that we can buy from you? Oh, um, well, you know what? I am going back to New York after this trip, so I guess we could do that, but I can also give you um, the names of places to get it. And, uh, and uh, we're, if anybody, um, if you want the DVD, sign up on my email list because we're going to take this recording and create a DVD out of it. Um, if anybody is ever having trouble finding anything, you can always contact me in New York, but I'm going to give you the places, you know, some, some places to start. Um, there's so much more to tell you about the size of the thread, what size works for what, the size of the French wire, the size of the needles. Um, you, we're going to cover all of that sitting around the tables, and then once we all get nodding, we're going to definitely solve all of the problems of the entire world, which is one of the added benefits. Any more questions? Okay, if you guys want to come back um, now or later this afternoon, and I can start teaching you about hands-on about the pearls. Thank you so much.